Hello and welcome to This Is What Democracy Looks Like, a podcast about policies that could deepen democracy. Each week we welcome a guest to teach us about a policy idea that could help extend more power to more people in more ways, that could increase our voice in the forces that govern our lives, that could help us co-create our shared world, that could, in short, deepen democracy. I'm your host, Pete Davis, director of the Democracy Policy Network. This week, we're talking cooperatives and employee ownership with Jason Weiner. Let's go. Sing me a song. You break branches fold. Oh, the winter's been long. In the summer of growing old. I am joined today by Jason Weiner. He runs a boutique law and consulting practice that helps folks navigate cooperative law, shared ownership models, cooperative finance, and worker ownership. He's the co-founder of Colorado Cooperative Developers. He's the chair of the Main Street Phoenix Project, a worker-owned holding company that is saving distressed restaurants during this pandemic crisis. He's helped on more than dozen worker cooperative conversions. And for those who don't know what that is, we'll get into that during this interview. And he is the co-chair of the first of its kind, Colorado Employee Ownership Commission. Jason, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to be here, Pete. Thank you for having me. We're so glad to have you on. I wanted to start with the brass tacks in this interview. What is employee ownership? What are cooperatives? But I think the most fun way to get into that is to hear the narrative story of how you got involved in this work. Because I assume you didn't, as a child, say, I want to be a cooperative lawyer. There must be something that turned you on to this. And so I'd love to hear, when did you first hear about cooperatives and employee ownership and the solidarity economy and things like this? How did you get started in this work? Well, that, that actually does go back to when I was in diapers. Little did I know the genesis of my trajectory to being a cooperative lawyer would start before I was even born. My dad actually bought his first home in a housing co-op in New York City. And for those who don't know, housing co-ops are the big city alternative to condos and and other kind of forms of apartment living. And they're pretty common in DC, New York, San Francisco. But my dad bought into essentially what was at the time a limited equity co-op in a new division in Queens. It was what's it called now? It was called Queens View West and it was in Long Island City in Queens. And what you bought in for was actually the same amount of capital that you would get out. And what you got for buying into the co-op was stable rent. And it was the first form of equity-based capped rent or or what they sometimes talk in New York and other places about. I forgot the term that's sometimes used. But anyway, you owned your property, but your rent was controlled, rent control. You didn't actually pay rent, you paid dues. So little did I know that was the kind of genesis of where I'd start, but I was turned on to it. I was working in big law in New York City, and I had the opportunity of a lifetime to go in-house for an employee-owned solar company in Colorado. And uh, I won't get into how I even discovered the opportunity, but I thought this this was the job of a lifetime, not only to be part of the new energy economy in 2009, but to be an in-house attorney for an employee-owned company. And I thought this is the confluence of the two things I was professionally most passionate about. I come from a background in labor studies and labor law, and I was passionate about the union movement, collective bargaining, but at a time when it was really passe and falling out of fashion. And so I went in-house, I really saw the power of, of shared equity, shared worker equity, and the promise of uh, co-ownership for middle and lower income folks who might not have that opportunity. That's how it all started. And from there, the rest has just been riding a wave. Wonderful. And then after being in-house there, you decided to start a firm that was just about cooperatives and employee ownership, correct? Yeah, exactly. It was taking that show on the road. It was really taking the full spectrum of what I did in-house and turning it into the kind of turning it into the umbrella for our firm. And so I essentially took that show on the road and we have clients now in more than 35 states, four countries. We have eight attorneys ranging from Ohio, Massachusetts, DC, New York, and we're most known for work in cooperatives, but we really specialize in the kind of broad range of options for employee ownership. Other than we don't practice in and or create ESOP plans, but uh, we're familiar in terms of policy work and advocacy. 
And one last biography thing I wanted to ask about before we get into kind of what these different words we're using mean. Yeah. You went to Cornell's ILR school, right? Yes. Or, and I, I'm just, so it's industrial labor relations at Cornell. And I just hear multiple good things coming out of this when it comes to big structural change thinking on the economy, that it's people thinking about opening up the black box of how the institutions of our economy are made. So could you just talk a little bit about that school for why do I keep seeing it come up in many of these great thinkers? Yeah, it was my formative, it was really the formative moment in my education, really shaped my ideology and, and affirmed my kind of underlying philosophy. I grew up with public uh, school teachers as parents. So they were both in New York City and suburban schools, which meant they were supported by a union. And we grew up in middle-class circumstances because the unions in New York are very powerful. And it was a natural evolution for me thinking about what it meant in the 80s and 90s growing up middle-class and how that prospect was all but all but impossible for my generation. So the ILR school was actually formed in the 50s as part of a land-grant program under New York State. And there are three of the seven colleges in at Cornell are land-grant programs and the, the purpose of the ILR school was to create the next uh, generation of labor leaders. It started out purely focused on the labor movement and training the labor leaders of tomorrow. It evolved in the 70s and 80s to produce consultants and even folks doing modern day or contemporary HR. We're now in the third iteration where I think, and it's been a long time since I've been back, but I think the whole notion of labor relations is evolving as employment regulation is evolving as the underlying uh, structures in our employment and our economy are shifting. And I think cooperatives are really at the leading edge of a lot of that. And so we're studying, uh, we have to study and think about how we're seeing the erosion of traditional employment, but the growth of freelance workers and atomized work in our economy. And with it comes the total deterioration of private sector collective bargaining but Cornell is one of only a handful of labor-oriented programs. There's one at Berkeley, and not coincidentally, the other one is at Rutgers. And the Rutgers Center uh, focuses on employee ownership, where Dr. Uh, Joe Blasey is one of the, the leading thinkers and writers on the subject. And so Rutgers has really focused the two things together. ILR, I think, has produced really formative thinking and design and professionals. So I either coming out of ILR was going to become a management consultant, an MBA, or a lawyer. And what I do today is really a combination of all three, but I get to wear my lawyer hat. And that's the background. When I went to school, there was almost no mention of unions at all. And there was no mention of the idea that you would dream of being a labor leader. Yeah. And now in the last few years, we're finally seeing that come back. And it's always interesting to hear about a time when that was so normal that you would say, oh, university, it needs to train like business leaders, government leaders, religious leaders, and labor leaders. And I think we're going to see things like this in a new form. And go back to that education today, actually. And I we used to joke, we would read, we would read, writings of Karl Marx in every semester, in almost every class for four years. And so it's just so unbelievable. That would be totally, polit that would be politically impossible. And it was socially not only acceptable, but it was just like common curriculum for us to learn, you know, about alternative economic systems. And it just became so normalized in my mind. It's Whatever. never been a foreign language or a passe subject. Let's now get into the like the details of what these words that we're using are. And I might just start from the, the total beginning. What is a cooperative? So a cooperative first is not a new fangled, wonky, fancy kind of advent of the millennial generation. It's actually a kind of, it's an economic construct that dates back to, it dates back millennia. A lot of First Nations and Indigenous groups organized commerce cooperatively before colonial settlement, before it. But what we know today as, and what we recognize as the cooperative tradition really evolved from Western Europe, uh, Northern Europe, Italy, Spain. And it's a construct whereby a business organization is formed by, of, and for members to solve their common needs and create an organization to help themselves. And it's designed to pool not just their capital, more importantly, their patronage 
And patronage is just the fancy term for contribution. Today, we have cooperatives in several formats. We have consumer cooperatives, which are food co-ops, where members come together for access to healthy, local, and in some ways, politically enlightened food to enfranchise and protect a just food system. And one's patronage in a food co-op is your purchasing. REI is another example. REI started because backcountry adventures in, I think it was the 20s, couldn't access affordable recreational gear. It was only affordable to the Vanderbilts and Rockefellers. And they came together to pool their purchasing power. Now, the consumer cooperative movement has gone through some ups and downs, and it's been in some ways confused with the consumer union movement of the 60s and 70s, but it's come back in vogue today in the context of online platforms and technology and thinking about how we protect ourselves, our identity, our data, our relationships in a virtual world where our patronage is our mind space and our attention. Another form of a cooperative is a marketing cooperative or a producer cooperative. That's a place where producers come together to access markets and help support fair, just prices for their goods. The purpose goes back more than 100 years, particularly for Southern Black farmers who were systematically removed and kept out of Northern food markets for agricultural products and commodities. And so Southern Black farmers organized some of the largest and earliest cooperatives to create marketplaces for their goods to access markets that cut through the racist and systemically exclusionary white-led distribution channels. A lot of those producers were in agriculture, but they've banded together in other commodities and in other markets. We also see a cousin to the producer co-op for marketing. And that's where independent either professionals or service providers might come together to market their goods. And the marketing co-op might be a place that, that houses back office support, like branding, answering phones, invoicing, systems creation, something to support independent workers. That's really coming back into vogue as a new structure to support freelance workers. In fact, several of our clients have developed marketplaces of, of cooperative backbones to support freelance workers. One is called Opolis. It's a, self, it's a place to form self-determined guilds of professionals that create the backbone architecture for independent workers. Another one is called Gilded, which is a project by the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Now, the last one is really the one I think we're talking about today, which is worker co-ops. You'll notice that I have, I've minimized the conventional co-ops in explaining what co-ops are, and that's on purpose because I think that's where we're seeing the most innovation and growth is in these non-traditional co-ops. A worker co-op is a co-op of workers that pool their labor together to produce goods and services. It's a relatively new adaptation of the model, but again, it harkens back hundreds of years. And so worker co-ops are companies owned by their workers, contractors, employees, self-employed owners to conduct commerce. And one's patronage in a worker co-op is their labor. I work there full time. Yes, I get paid a salary. I'm managed by a boss, but at the end of the day, it's my labor contribution that determines my share of profit. Um, now, the conventional co-ops, there's the rural electric co-ops that were spawned in the 30s from the Rural Electrification Act. It's what brought last mile service to rural America. Most of the landmass in America is electrified from co-ops. And then credit unions, which respond again to support the either unbankable, non-banked or underbanked through, again, federal policy. And credit unions are member-owned deposit organizations. They're owned by their depositors. There's no outside investors. And so to sum all this up, a co-op is like a traditional business entity where these shareholders are the people who produce or consume the value of the enterprise. And so there's a, a virtuous cycle instead of an extractive cycle of wealth creation. This is amazing. And could I just give a few examples for if listeners wanted to get really concrete about this on producer co-ops? So let's say when you see a farmer's market, farmer's markets are usually run municipally. You have a bunch of different people that are 
in the booths selling their farm goods, but they all have an interest in everyone coming to the farmer's market. So you could imagine a farmer's market that's run as a producer co-op where all the farmers, they might compete. They might have two people selling tomatoes and then they might compete hoping more people come to their booth than the other booth, but they want to cooperate in getting this market of people to come and buy their goods. And so it's like the equivalent of that. Is that a useful analogy to a producer really cooperative? Really useful one. Yeah. And what it highlights is two things. One, there's co-ops will often emerge where there are market failures. And we only think in America about market-driven enterprise that is induced or supported by the private sector, or where there's no market activity, we think of the public sector. And these two blunt poles really fail to appreciate the notion of elevated or collective self-interest. And so cooperatives are actually this third way that bridge the entrepreneurial kind of profit motive of capitalism with the underlying need for a safety net or for a convened marketplace. And so co-ops have emerged, A, to create marketplaces where none existed. Think market for black farmers. The other is to grow markets and to keep them accountable and healthy. And yes, you'll often see competing producers, more than one corn producer that is a member in a co-op, And what's so fascinating is that they democratically determine policy, pricing, and strategy to grow the market so that they can compete in a healthy and vibrant way that supports all of their livelihoods. It's the rising tide lifting all boats. And it requires, in most cases, literally no public policy support and no outside capital if done right. And so many co-ops will skip the step of raising venture capital because they can finance themselves from their members. And very few of them require any sort of kind of fiscal intervention from government. And so it's this really underappreciated third way. It reminds me of this philosopher I like, Roberto Unger, says we're stuck in this false hydraulic model of the economy where all of our economic debates are more market or more state. Do you believe in the state or do you believe in the market? But what it seems that people like you are asking is it's not more market or less state. It's what type of market? It's what are the actual designs of the institutions in the economy? And how do we bridge civic notions of democracy and market-based transactions. It's really no coincidence that as Cuba, for instance, begins to denationalize its economy, it's actually generating hundreds of new co-ops. If you can believe it, Cuba has increased the number, they've grown their cooperative sector orders of magnitude faster than we have in the US because they've chosen a privatization strategy that pushes state commerce into cooperative enterprise rather than going full-fledged into private commerce. And it's a strategy both from the end of state plan socialism, as well as from pure form capitalism. We're seeing a convergence that I think in a generation is going to be commonplace. And just because, so let's get into some of these other terms in the constellation around cooperatives. Not all co-ops are alike. There's a lot of ways the shape can take form. Just there's many types of triangles, scaling, right? Many types of ways of shaping this. There's some basic principles, but there's a lot of range of how involved are the members versus are the members just like paper owners and they just, the money's distributed in a fair way, but it, they're not like going to meetings to all the way to all the members are having a meeting every night about how things are run. And so I'd love to hear about this phrase employee ownership, which is slightly different than the phrase an employee owned worker cooperative. What kind of is different about the phrase of what is employee ownership capture that worker cooperative does not? Yeah, so the concept of employee ownership is a wrapper. It's a broad umbrella, and it's a it's not a legal term of art. It's more of a construct that depends on substance more than form. Of the forms, a worker-owned cooperative is one, but it's one of many. And the idea of employee ownership is it's a construct whereby a company intentionally begins a process of sharing the the attributes of ownership with their workers, employees, contractors, advisors. And we are use intentionally general language because there's lots of species and there's lots of examples. A worker-owned cooperative can be suitable for certain applications and perhaps not others of the different types. So it's one where there are aspects of ownership. And by that, ownership is a bundle of rights. So what does that mean? 
when we think about sharing ownership, we think voting rights, information rights, economic rights, participatory rights in the enterprise of the firm and the enterprise of the business. More than just empowering people on a team, it's about tying their voice and giving them in, in information, empowering them to have meaningful impact on and a voice into the success and direction of the firm. And that can take several different stripes, but also it's a way of tying their benefit to the performance and benefit of the firm. And so that's an easy example. And it's been used for decades. In fact, there's all this preferential stuff in the tax code that for decades has made tech companies extend ownership to their early employees in the form of stock options. Stock options are absolutely a form of employee ownership. What makes them fall short of being recognized as employee ownership is the extent to which the option pool is embedded in the DNA of the company. It's usually 5, 10, 15%. And so what we say is this is about a continuum. And I would rather see more tech companies and more companies in general adopt stock option plans or phantom stock plans that put them on the radar, put them on the spectrum, that make it then easier to build systems of trust and communication and create more profit sharing and gain sharing so that the company can find a smooth glide path as the owners begin to find either their exit or retirement. So stock options is one. Phantom stock is another. Worker co-ops are yet another. We also see broad-based ownership within small LLCs and corporations. Something called profits interest LLCs include the opportunity for broad-based ownership within a very simple and very common business structure. The biggest and most well-recognized and most well-developed is the ESOP, which is an acronym that stands for an Employee Stock Ownership Plan. That is a particular species that is a creature of the tax code, and it's a creature of the Employment Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA, of 1974. And it was a very specific vehicle to create a qualified retirement pension trust that would come to own stock in the company. The trust is the holder of stock, but the trust then creates a platform for wealth creation for employees. So it's a derivative structure and we can get into some of the details, but I just wanted to put all those elements or all those kind of details on the spectrum. And ESOPs are, is it that you just, when you have stock in a company, it's not just that you get kind of dividends or you can sell the stock later and make money off of that. It's also that you get voting rights. True? True. Or, well, it depends. So typically yeah. in a co-op, yes, one member, one vote, you get voting rights. In certain types of equity plans, you do get voting rights. If you're so, if you're issued in an early stage company, for instance, restricted shares, very often those come with voting rights. You're a common shareholder. Some profits interest plans will also include voting rights. ESOPs and employee ownership trusts, two slightly different creatures, are a little different. In an ESOP, the employee doesn't technically own corporate stock. What they own is a share of the assets in the trust. And the trust has, is represented by a fiduciary, a trustee. And it's the trustee that exercises the voting power held in the trust. So it's a little more complicated than a traditional direct form of ownership. But you've got the corporation, which issues stock. And that could be still issued to management, but also this trust. The trust then issues shares to employees. Those shares are revalued every year. The trust can lever itself up with debt, and it can actually borrow money to finance the purchase of corporate stock from owners. But the employees will vest that stock as they work at a place. And the longer they're there, the more shares they are allocated. And when they retire or when they come of age, they can begin to receive distributions of the trust shares. But it's a derivative Ill issue because the employees never really have a voting right at the corporate boardroom. What I hope listeners are taking away from this, you're going to have to go into all the weeds if you want to do some fight for something like this in your state. But what I hope you can take away from this conversation is there are many ways to design this. Margaret Thatcher was wrong. There is an alternative. There are dozens of alternatives. Two final things on just the forms of different co-ops. When I first heard about cooperatives, I 
was excited. And then I got a little depressed because I, I thought, oh gosh, we have to grow cooperatives from the ground up. They're like one less than 1% of things in America. And we're going to have to create business schools for all the cooperatives. And we're going to have to slowly grow it over time. And it's going to take a century. But then I heard about this thing called co-op conversion, that you can actually take things that aren't a co-op now and make them a co-op or an ESOP or some form. Could you tell us about co-op conversion? Yeah. So like any business entity, a business can be formed today as an LLC, as a corporation, a public benefit corporation. But what's really exciting, and and startups, by the way, are hard. They take a long time. Not all of them become profitable. The failure rate is high. But what's really both exciting and in this moment, absolutely necessary is that to make sure that the largest wealth transfer in human history, which is occurring today, as baby boomers are retiring, there are tens of millions of baby boomers retiring with millions of businesses up for sale or potentially about to wither on the vine. With so many of those businesses coming of age and looking to find buyers, but generally speaking, here's some grave statistics. For businesses valued at a million dollars or less, only 20% of them or less ever find a buyer. That means over 80% of small businesses in America will never find a buyer. And many of them have no family members who want to take over the business. That means most of those businesses will get gobbled up by bigger competitors or will die and just be dissolved and have assets sold at auction. And And there are trillions, tens of trillions of dollars in assets that are changing hands from generation to generation. And We need to find a way, and many are finding a way of taking these existing businesses and rather than selling them to Amazon or to um, a bigger conglomerate or to a private equity fund, or rather than uh, just looking to one's children to take over the business, there are many out there, us included, who are helping business owners transition the ownership of their business to their employees. For many longtime businesses, the, the, the owner knows The employees are the secret ingredient that made the business what it is and that make it viable and that make it worth saving. And this is an opportunity to save existing businesses. Many of them were profitable before COVID. Many are struggling, but the employees are the linchpin to the business being able to continue. And to do that is is not as hard as it sounds. There are many forms to do it. There are lots of professionals to help. But what that allows is for the wealth that's been created and for all the systems that have been created in a business, for all of that to be shared broadly by the people that make the business successful and sustainable. Amazing. And just for the listeners, this is not some pie in the sky theory and some law review somewhere. You've had literally people walk into your office and you've had over a dozen that you have converted businesses into yep. some form of employee ownership. Yeah, we've done actually several dozen of these. One is an exciting example in Cleveland, Ohio. We worked with a group that facilitated the sale of a residential and commercial insulation company that did home insulation and energy audits and employed tradespeople in downtown Cleveland and the surrounding areas. And we helped them convert the business from a 50 something year old business owner and to sell to their employees. The employees took over ownership of the business with the support of outside capital and training. And they've actually since acquired a competitor. They've scaled in COVID. They've grown by acquiring a competitor as a profitable business. And all the fruits of their labor in some form or fashion go back to the workers. There's a pathway for this business to now be generationally sustainable. And that old owner made money on the sale. Made money on the sale. <laughs> yeah, so this recognized is... not just financially, but also in the community for creating lots of new owners and for sharing wealth broadly. But he did not have to. He did not have to take pennies on the dollar to exit his business. Final thing before we get into the policy, because this is about what state policies can help this institutional form grow. But final uh, form. Tell us about the Main Street Phoenix project. Very interesting thing, very COVID relevant. 
Yeah. So in my work of supporting these employee ownership conversions for a decade, the work is important, but it's slow and it's resource intensive. And there's no multiplier effect. For every, for every conversion, we have one business converted into one business. It's still compete, competing in a consolidating or fragmented market. And for small to mid-sized firms, it's a cutthroat environment. And when COVID hit, it really became clear we needed to significantly scale, streamline, and accelerate the work of conversions. And I was sitting on my front porch three days into lockdown and came up with what has been percolating in my mind. We've created a turnkey private equity holding company that is entirely employee-owned. And our strategy is to be a turnkey pr- buyer. We go, to a rest- we go to a business owner. We're focused right now on restaurants and main street businesses. And we're telling the business owner, we're like any other buyer. We know your business was successful. It's struggling now. And this could be someone who's ready to throw in the towel. And we're here to, we're here to provide you a graceful exit from the business. But most importantly, we're here to live out your legacy is taking care of your workers. Let us buy your business and we will immediately bring your employees into the fold as owners of the holding company will scale by acquiring business after business and operating them under a group with the support of a robust enterprise back office that will handle benefits and training and financing, find capital. And our purpose is to create an economic resilience platform for workers. And so we essentially operate a group. We will operate a group that brings these businesses to to greater profit margins and generates excess income for the benefit of workers. And we've modeled this out. We're raising capital. And right now we're, able, we're looking at bringing on over 500 worker owners to, from 25 businesses and being able to pay them best in class wages, move away from the tipped wage system and generate wealth for them in the form of health benefits, professional development benefits, training, upward mobility, job mobility, and give them paid time off, as well as offer them uh, fringe benefits that are just totally unavailable when you work for a restaurant. It seems like you are inverting the yeah. classic private equity vulture model where That's you know exactly. all these restaurants are bleeding on the ground. I'm going to come in, I'm going to buy them all up, fire everyone and take it out. You exactly also it. are circling around, but instead of doing that, you're making them better by turning them into employee owner, into worker co-ops. Amazing. And the worker owners participate in a diversified portfolio. They'll get a profit share of their restaurant, but more importantly, they're owners of an enterprise. You're right. We have totally inverted the private equity model and swapped out the LP investors for workers. So our purpose is to generate wealth and economic resilience for workers using a portfolio strategy. Amazing. Wow. Okay. In these final, we're coming near the end of the interview. Before we go, I really want to get into the weeds of if I was a state leader, if I'm governor or a state legislator, state AG, or even running a state university, any state leader, how can I help grow this beneficial, promising, inspiring alternative model? And you seem to be the perfect person to talk to for this because you are the chair of the first in its kind Colorado Employee Ownership Commission. So Colorado is leading the way on this. And I'd love to hear first, what is the deal with the Colorado Commission? And what are some of the state policies that you're discovering through that commission that are promising to bring to other states? So our esteemed governor, Polis, ran on a platform for economic empowerment through employee ownership. He himself has started, run, and exited from several highly successful ventures. And he likes, he's proud to say that in all of them, he adopted a form of employee ownership, whether it was an option plan or some other benefit pool. He has been keen and very supportive, even before when he was in the U.S. House of Representatives, he's been very supportive of employee ownership. And this was a top three agenda item for him in his campaign. So back in 2019, he issued an executive order that created the Employee Ownership Commission to reduce barriers to adoption, to reduce cost, and to promote employee ownership as a vital strategy for the state of Colorado. 
And so as a commission, we work across sectors and across industries to develop policy, education, and marketing tools to support greater adoption of employee ownership. None of these ideas are new to me, but we have an opportunity now on two flanks to adopt generationally impactful policy to drive employee ownership. There are two different uh, types. One is to change state policy. And this, I think, would take a fairly significant stakeholder process. But there's a few elements of policy that I'm really keen on. One is to is for states to adopt legislatively supported centers on employee ownership. And Colorado has done this actually through its commission. We didn't need legislation. We created the Office of Employee Ownership within our Office of Economic Development. That happened through the executive order, through executive agencies. And I think Legislators and policymakers really need to understand the power of a supportive executive to do a lot through his or her or their agencies. But state centers are critical. Support for technical assistance is critical. So too are the hindrances, the policy hindrances to employee ownership. I'm a real big fan of instituting a worker's first right of refusal that before a business owner can offer to sell his or her their business to a private equity buyer or a strategic buyer, they should be legally required to make an offer to the employees. This is already policy in housing in Boston and Washington, D.C. Yeah. And for our listeners, that is the COPA and TOPA laws, community opportunity to purchase, tenant opportunity to purchase. Is there, I know there, I don't think there's any precedent in the U.S., but is there any precedent around the world for a worker or proposals? Could you talk a little bit about that? I think it's in Italy and Emilia Romagna. I think there are a few either local ordinances, or there may even be regional um, or national laws on worker first refusal. It's been written about by the Democracy Collaborative. There's a white paper on the topic, and it's been researched. It's not a very common structure here in the U.S. Now, that aside, that I think the moment now, I think, can be more, we can be more acutely impactful on the tax side on fiscal policy. And here's where there's rapidly developing policy around the country of four different types. One is we have federal tax legislation that encourages employee ownership conversions under Internal Revenue Code Section 1042. It's otherwise known as a capital gains deferral. There are state measures now that are expanding on that as a capital gains exclusion for a business owner to exclude the capital gain on the sale of a business altogether if they sell to a worker-owned co-op, ESOP, employee ownership trust, or other employee-owned business. That's a capital gains exclusion. That's one popular tax policy making the rounds. That could be millions of dollars saved for you selling. That's a real incentive there. uh, That's at a state level, but yes. Right now, the policy at the federal level allows you to defer that gain long-term, which is fantastic. So there are other tax mechanisms here too, which is a transferable tax credit for a business that is converting so that they can use the tax credit from both the seller and transfer it to the buyer to cover some of the conversion costs for technical assistance or other professional services. Right now, any sort of technical assistance support inures to the seller, but many of these conversions actually require a buyer and the buyer doesn't get to take the benefit of that tax credit or the grant or the loan program. There is discussion around creating a transferable tax credit that gives some cash flow support to the buying entity to recoup some of its out-of-pocket expense. The two other ones that are actually most meaningful, one is, at, again, at again the federal level, there's a limited lender interest exclusion. So for a seller or a bank or any other financial institution that loans money to facilitate a, an employee ownership conversion. Say it, it lends money to a worker-owned co-op to buy the business from the seller. There's a limited exclusion on the interest that they get on that loan. And states can move to exclude the same interest from its income tax at the state level. That would incentivize and provide enormous tax benefits to the financial institutions that can support these deals. It ultimately means lower cost of capital for the borrower, for the the employees, but it means more financiers are going to get into the business of lending to employee ownership conversions. That could be huge. The last one is one I'm most excited about, which is currently most ESOPs, and this is very technical, very wonky, but this is where the discussion needs to go. Right now, most ESOPs are structured as S-Corp 
for tax purposes. The corporation actually pays no income tax. Income flows through to the employee ownership trust or the employee owned trust. The trust is actually a tax exempt qualified retirement account. So it pays no income tax. So it's this enormous tax efficient vehicle for wealth creation because all the wealth and it passes through the corporation tax free to the retirement accounts of employees. Co-ops, unfortunately, pay corporate income tax on retained earnings, on the reinvested income that is not passed through to their owners. And so we're pushing for an income tax exclusion from reinvested profits in co-ops, employee ownership trusts, and other employee-owned LLCs. What that would mean is essentially that a co-op can build up and scale and grow and reinvest in its future on a tax-exempt basis on that income. The income dollar for dollar can get reinvested. And that alone could drive significant adoption of employee of worker-owned co-ops and conversions. So we talked about having technical support. We talked about financing and taxes and things like that. Could I ask a few rapid fire questions about some others? Procurement. Is there stuff we can do with government purchasing from co-ops? Gar Alperovitz always talks about you want anchor institutions buying from co-ops. Yeah. yeah talk a bit about that. Yeah, that's a fraught subject right now. And I'll tell you why. Initially, the thinking is that the anchor institution strategy can drive significant market share and just gross volume of business to worker-owned enterprises. The problem in practice and for a lot of policymakers is that there's a perception that a procurement preference for worker-owned firms will reduce market share by certified women or minority-owned businesses that currently enjoy procurement preferences. So that's based on a false notion because most of the women and, and minority business owned certifications actually also work with ESOPs and co-ops. And we've written a white paper that's available online talking specifically about the subject of employee owned firms that still qualify for women and minority owned business certification. If those certifiers can grow increasingly comfortable with employee owned firm structures, we don't have to lose those certifications and we can adopt a new procurement preference that doesn't for, that doesn't dilute the existing preferences. So that one requires very careful policy development and those are some issues that need to be understood, but on the whole the market opportunity for the anchor institution strategy is enormous, absolutely enormous. And I think that's one of the most vital tools for national scaling of employee ownership. One more is what I've wondered about this, what I'd call corporation cooperative parity in government. So governments have small business centers. Governments have curriculums in high schools telling kids about how to start a business. Governments have public universities that teach, have business schools. Is there any push on just saying anytime you mention to a kid, start a business or anytime you have a hotline to help you start a business or anytime you have a business school that's training people to help start businesses, you have to also mention cooperatives. I, I don't know. Has there been any thinking on that? Because I sometimes get annoyed when I say, why is my government preferencing one institutional form over another? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. There's already precedent for that. The Main Street Employee Ownership Act, which passed in 2017, ordered the Small Business Administration and all SBDC offices to educate their clientele about co-ops. And so there's already a mandate for the entire SBA network, which is the largest national service provider to small business in America. They are required to provide edu to learn about and provide education about co-ops. Yes, I think it can go further. And uh, this needs to be a condition for, for all kinds of federal expenditures, whether it's qualifying for public contracts or for anything else that these institutions are part of the kind of block grant program needs to really seriously consider this as part of the core community development strategy. They already do this with community development conditions on block grants. And I absolutely think that we need a narrative parity. I think that's really important. Final wonky question before we wrap up. There was recently a launch of a thing called Carta X, which is, is has been a 
the talk of Silicon Valley recently about making a much more liquid market for shares in private companies. So you have a very liquid market when a company IPOs, but it's much less liquid when a company is still private. And I'd be interested in if there's any co-op thinking or in your world of drafting a lot of these kind of share and equity contracts of the promise for local stock exchanges, secondary markets, not needing to be a unicorn to quote unquote exit to a community, to a larger set of owners. You've mentioned before to me that Michigan used to have a statute of, used to have local stock exchanges until the 30s when those, those all got wiped out. Could you talk a bit about that and if that's relevant to this conversation? Yeah, I think it's highly relevant. Stock exchanges for secondary securities are traditionally and I think appropriately fraught with concern around speculation and around small investors and about what happens in marketplaces. What happened with GameStop and Robinhood is really a perfect example of market dynamics around securities. And so I think we need to be really careful that we're not undoing or applying the pressure of security speculation onto business ownership, especially employee ownership. With that said, there's a lot of opportunity. In fact, one of our clients is actually creating uh, crypto, essentially cryptocurrency or tokenization of cooperative patronage to allow worker owners in a co-op to take their allocated, their accumulated patronage allocations and use that as currency in a secondary market. That's actually happening right now. We've created a few of those private mechanisms, but what's exciting is the the scale of companies that have stock option plans where workers never are able to monetize. There are these sharks out there now that essentially are offering to buy phantom stock and stock options for pennies on the dollar. These secondary markets really empower people to find liquidity and actually earn the kind of wealth that they were promised. And I think in appropriate use cases, it's a powerful instrument to generate broad-based wealth. I think the more the more remote those transactions, the more they need regulation. So I think we just need to be careful about creating a, a mechanism for further speculation. But all that said, the more we can do to share the gain of firm gain with their primary contributors of value, the better. Carta is a really exciting use case. I think blockchain and crypto provide another enormous opportunity. There are there's talk of the SEC expanding some of their exemptions to allow platform companies to issue equity to their platform users. All of these are, are mechanisms, necessary and important political mechanisms to allow broad-based wealth sharing, which is perversely not allowed under you know, securities law or in some cases, employment law. Jason Weiner, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything I didn't ask about, anything people should read, check out, anything you want to plug uh, to our listeners about things like this and ways they can use co-ops and employee ownership to deepen democracy? I really appreciate the opportunity. I would turn folks over. The Main Street Phoenix Project is convening a digital event on sustainable food systems, the restaurant industry, and co-ops. March 12th, there's going to be information on our website coming soon. Our website is mainstreet.coop. Jason Weiner, PC, JR Weiner PC. Our website is jrweiner.com. We have a lot of blog content and video content on the subject. My One of my favorites is a talk that I did with Pete at a Harvard Law School a few years back. That's a fun one, but um, just really grateful to be uh, to be with you today, Pete. Thank you, and keep up the good fight in Colorado, leading the country on bringing many of these co-op friendly policies to the states. Thank you, Jason. My pleasure. Thank you, Pete. <laughs>